Uh, let's continue. Our next guest is one of the most respected editors of the last 40 years. In the 1970s, he helped shape some of the most some of the decade's most memorable films, beginning with Lamont Johnson's The Last American Hero and continuing with The Trial of Billy Jack, French Connection 2, Taxi Driver, Black Sunday, New York, New York, Blue Collar, and Hardcore. Tom Rolfe established himself as one of the best in the business. The 1980s saw him associated with some of the most notorious, Heaven's Gate, Nine and a Half Weeks, and some of the most popular, War Games, Stakeout, Black Rain, films of that decade. On the right stuff, Rolf was part of the creative team that kept Phil Kaufman's intimate epic from feeling indulgent by knowing exactly the tempo required for each scene. And the film special effects sequences are cut so beautifully that they are at once that they at once stick out without ever overwhelming the rest of the film. And for this masterful for and for his masterful job of editing, Tom Rolfe received the best editing Oscar, which he shared with Glenn Farr, Lisa Fruckman, Stephen A. Rotter, and the late Douglas Stewart. It is my pleasure to welcome Academy Award-winning editor Tom Rolfe to Back by Midnight. Mr. Rolfe? Yes, here I am, Aaron. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing okay. A little hung, well, not hungover, but what do you call it, uh, uh, jet-lagged from uh, flight in from London. Okay. And, uh, so, I hope I did a, a serviceable uh, job of pronouncing your your last name. It can be a little tongue-twisting with that. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, it's Rolf. It's uh, usually Rolf is a because uh, I'm of Swedish extraction. Rolf is used as a forename or a prename, um, not usually as a surname. So right. uh, it's quite unusual that way. But uh, that was my my father um, <laughs> used it all his life, and so right. I figured it's just as good for me. Yeah. Well, let me ask you: How how did you get into film editing or editing in general? Well, um, basically, uh, I had a lucky break in that uh, my stepfather um, was a contract director at MGM. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I got out of the service way back in the 50s, I had no idea what I was going to do. And, and But he lived in a nice big house and a nice shiny car. And I said, well, I, if I want to do what you do, how would I get started? And... Uh, his answer was that if he had to start all over again, he would try to be a film editor first. And uh, I had no idea what that meant. So he explained to me that um, the film editor is the one person who sees whatever was shot the previous day. He gets to see and evaluate what was done uh, performance-wise, etc., cetera, um, before anybody else. No one else sees that prior to the film editor. Mm -hmm. And if for no other, just through osmosis, you will learn how to... Uh, evaluate film what's good what's bad and uh, and that's the film editor's job and that kind of sunk in at the time and i was the, the best offer i had uh it was very difficult to get into these studios even with you were having a relative involved at that time because unions controlled so much and it was a very very difficult and lengthy process and from about i think it took about two years i finally got a job as, as an apprentice right and that's what started me. And once I got into the cutting rooms, I just became enamored of the whole, the whole thing. Even though it was at that time there was a, uh, a union bylaw that said that you must work eight years as a assistant or an apprentice or whatever before you were ever even allowed to uh, apply for a job as a full editor. Right. And uh, that that kind of that, that was a rather daunting future to uh, for a young man at that point yeah. but uh i saw with it Thelma Just, schoonmaker talked about that uh yeah uh you know scorsese always wanted her on raging bull and she said you know and at the time she said uh you know by that time she had done so much work she she didn't feel that <laughs> you know she she didn't feel that she had to go through that eight-year apprenticeship right uh, I'm, uh from what, what she told me i'm guessing they uh rectify that bylaw to a certain extent. Well, now it doesn't exist and hasn't existed now for a few years, but I must yeah. tell you I'm uh, very deeply grateful for the for the experience even though it was very frustrating for uh, right. for a young guy 
Um, but the knowledge that you, what you saw and what you learned and what you were, what you were taught um, by the old, older editors and the little tricks and little, uh, uh, yeah, little ways to to, to uh, solve uh, story problems and so mm-hmm. on. Uh, you never that that uh, what uh, that doesn't exist anymore, and so people. Uh, even though people can consider, they can name themselves, they can buy a machine and say, "I'm now a film editor." It takes a long, it takes a little bit more than that. And right. uh, well, uh, looking at your at the filmography, I got to ask about an early title that's on your list, uh, and if you can explain the uh, association with it. Uh, and uh, what did you and find? <laughs> and that's Clambake. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. What do you want to know? Uh, it said so. You were the you were an editor on Clambake. I was. Okay. Uh, tell me about that. I mean, that's uh, that's an Elvis movie. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. an Elvis movie. That's correct. So, what is uh, what's the edict on an Elvis? Um, am I am I safe in assuming that you know make sure make all the musical numbers make Elvis look good and the other well, stuff? I mean, yeah, there was a. Uh, it was a 28-day shoot. We shot it in under a month. It was um, how do I say? It? I think it was a second second feature I'd edited. So I was just starting out basically, and the company I'd worked for as an assistant editor doing uh, uh, the Rifleman television series and uh, um, Big Valley and those because that's what I kind of started out doing in, in, right. in the states. Um, they had this contract with the uh, with the United Artists to provide a, a film, and uh, with Elvis, and uh, I was given the opportunity to to cut it. And of course, I, I would have taken any job at all at, at that mm-hmm. point. And it was a it was a delightful experience. It's not a very good film. In fact, it's a it's a dreadful film in many ways. Uh, <laughs> well, the music. Well, let me is, ask, let yeah. me ask you this. Uh, you, can you, you're you, you're very upfront. You said it's a dreadful film because you know. People now are very diplomatic when they talk about when films are coming out and they're doing publicity. But what's it like being uh, someone on a film, your credits on a film, and you're in that post-production process, and you know it's not going to work? I mean, it's one thing if you're the screenwriter and that's pre-production and it's out of your hands or you're the the actor and you're in production and so you think you're good and it's out of your hands after when it goes into post, but... You're in the final stretch. So, what's it like being an editor on a film when you can, when I'm guessing in, it, you may not tell anyone, but you know in your heart of hearts that this is not a good film. Oh, we, 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 there was more than one of us who knew that. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, we also knew that we didn't have any money for retakes. There was nothing, <laughs> and we had a pro- problem with the music, as I recall. Um, gosh, I can't remember the uh, Jeff. Oh, yes, I can. Jeff Jeff Alexander was the name of the uh, the, the music mogul at the time, and he. They recorded Elvis's music all in back east in Tennessee or wherever, wherever it was, and laid down the tracks there. And when we got when we got to MGM and, and recorded the music, it was totally out of uh, out of what would you call it uh, out of pitch, mm. and so there was like a half tonal pitch between Elvis's uh, lyrics and uh, the recording of the master tracks in at MGM. Mm-hmm. So we had a terrible time trying to, if you if you raise the or increase the speed of the, the to to raise the pitch, you also everything went out of sync, you know, with this dialogue and so on. Right. So they did have a machine that they finally were able to to uh, to I think of where they got it. I think they got it through Panavision or somebody that somebody had come up with an idea that they could do they could do exactly uh, correct exactly the problem that we had. And we finally, like on the last day of mixing, were able to uh, to um, yeah, circumvent the problem. But right. we, we, I don't think anybody took took the picture very seriously. And it was one of, of uh, Elvis's earlier works when he was still very much a uh, yeah, kind of a kind of a flamboyant. And uh, he was a kid and right. uh, loved by everybody. He was nice to everybody. He was a, he was a joy to be around. And called everybody sir because that way he didn't have to remember their names. He he, he met so many people every day. Uh, yeah, he was just he was a joy. But deep down inside, you know, as you point out, everybody knew that it was a it was not a picture that was going to be memorable. Uh, right. 
Uh, it, well, it, but I, I, I still, as a, I certainly don't deny having worked on that picture because I, I did the best I could, I think, with what I had uh, to work with. And uh, let me ask you this: that because you said you did, you were editor on the Rifleman in the Big Valley. Yeah. And well, no, I, I, gotta, met, I was the assistant on the on the Rifleman, and then Rifleman. I was a big, I became an editor on Big Valley. Yeah. Big Valley. Yeah. And I got to assume that starting out uh, on television shows with this, you know, with these quick turnarounds, that must be a good training to like really become efficient and you know, work under pressure. It was very much so, yeah. And then you didn't have you didn't have time to sit around and just play and try this and try that. You put it together and it was it was uh yeah. Your your instincts had to be good. And um it was a wonderful training ground. Uh and as you say, a lot of the uh well top guys that are still still uh, cutting, they came out of television as well. It was back right. in the fifties and sixties. Um, yeah, and it's a, you, when you learned your craft, and that's why the eight years was a, a wonderful learning, learning experience. If you just join us, we're talking to Academy Award-winning film editor Tom Rolfe about many things on his uh, resume, uh, but also in a minute we'll be talking about The Right Stuff, which he won his Oscar as one of the creative team editing that uh, American epic. Well, i got to ask real quick because uh, I'm a huge um uh, uh, my my favorite all time filmmaker is Martin Scorsese. So I got to uh-huh. ask, uh, uh-huh. and I had an interview last week with Michael Chapman uh, talking about uh, Raging Bull, which is not on Blu-ray, but we also talked about Taxi Driver. Right. So I got to ask about how did you get hooked up with uh, Scorsese to edit? I guess be an editor on Taxi Driver and uh, New York, New York. The what happened was I had had a uh, assistant working with me on a prior film, and I can't remember exactly which, what the title of that one was, but I got a call one day from him saying, look, we got a problem. Could you, would you be interested in coming over and uh, doing a picture with this guy, Marty Scorsese? And I think my assistant had worked with him with, with Big Bad Bertha or something, Bertha in the title. I think. Oh, uh, Boxcar Bertha. Boxcar Bertha, yeah, right. And, and the, the film before Taxi Driver, I guess, is uh, Lucky Lady in uh, uh, Fear Lucky- on Trial. Fear on Trial or some of the... Uh... Yeah, Lucky Lady was... Uh, I just came in and I did one big sequence at the end, the, the end sequence on that. Right. And Fear on Trial was a Hallmark Hall of Fame with George C. Scott, mm. as I remember. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> There's so many going back over the years. Right. But anyway, getting back to Scorsese, uh, I got a call. Would you come in and, and look at uh, some dailies? They, they need some, some help right away. Because, um, as I recall, Marty had finished shooting the picture in uh, New York, had uh, had hired an, a film editor, uh, um, Marsha Lucas, but had asked her, by all means, look at the dailies, but don't cut anything until I finish shooting, and then we'll we'll both sit, we'll get together and, and cut the picture together. So um, they, he he then. Um, took two weeks off over a Christmas vacation or something, and then decided to come in and start shoot, start cutting at the first of the year. Whereupon he was told by the I think it was Columbia that uh, they said, "Well, we hope you um, you know you know, hope you realize that you are committed to turning over a uh, a cut to Columbia or a finished uh, first trial in eight weeks." and uh, Evidently, Marty had not really paid too much attention to the contract uh, contract mm-hmm. obligations, so therefore there was a panic, and uh, so Marcia and I started cutting on the uh, on the picture uh, with Mo- with Marty being in- involved, of course, and then later we brought in, in a third editor to uh, pick up some of the slack so that we weren't falling behind, and um, on the strength of just that relationship between uh, Marty and myself and uh, Marcia. Uh, when the time came and he did New York, New York, I had a call for that. And also, by the way, I did get a call on Ra- a Raging Bull, but I was doing another picture. So that was one of those things that, yeah, what a shame, because that uh, Raging Bull is a magnificent piece of film, I think. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I'm I'm just curious, when there's multiple editors like that, uh, yeah. are, is I guess is everyone given kind of a, a section or a sequence to work on? Well, yes and, yes and no. Dep- it depends on the director. It depends on the, the time involved and everything mm-hmm. else. Just like in the uh, right stuff, the the normal what happened on Taxi Driver, as I recall, and don't forget we're talking. This is like 
This is like a quarter of a century ago. Right. Um, we all t- took sequences and put them together, but then we didn't. We didn't own the sequences, as it were. We would. If I did a sequence and I turned it, uh, turned just gave it, showed it to uh, to Marty, and then Marty would say, "Okay, well, this should be done, and maybe that, and we can shorten this, and that, blah blah blah." Whoever was available would just grab that reel and just uh, work out those changes. Right. And the same thing with, the, with whatever Marsha had done, uh, I would grab her reel and, and effect the changes. That so there was no personal style. Everybody, had, every editor has a uh, if, if it's not stylized, it's a certain uh, tempo uh, it works mm-hmm. with a certain rhythm and so there was nothing nobody could protect their own little <laughs> bailiwick if you will uh, right. having done something so it worked out very well and I, the picture was well as you know it's still a it's, a, it's still quite a, uh, a famous film gonna... yeah well and so uh, I guess getting bringing to the subject at hand uh, 1979 I guess uh, that's when you do hardcore and uh I guess that was your second time working with Paul Schrader. Cause Paul Schrader, did, yeah, I did uh, Blue, Blue Collar Blue, first. Blue Collar, which is a remarkable piece of work. Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a good, one of my favorites, too. I think it's a it, good film. It's really, really, really good. And Hardcore is terrific. And yeah. There's a lot of terrific, uh, you know, the the editing of the, the nightlife sequences are really, really fine. Uh, I, so, I, don't, I don't remember them that well. I have to go <laughs> back and take a look. Yeah. And so was it because of that? that How, how did your name get to uh, Philip Kaufman? I guess he was in you know, I, I I don't know. I know this that at the time, right stuff was being uh, they had been shooting for for months for a long time, and there was a there was a, a, a what do you call it, a length problem. Uh, right. The lad problem. The lad company. Um, they, they, the picture was running like three hours long or something, and and, and they the, the other people had been working on it for months and months. And I just, I think I just, I can't remember. Oh, I finished uh, War Games, I think that's what, no, yeah, War Games, I think. And I got a call saying, would you come up to San Francisco and uh, with a new set of eyes, uh, looking to see what they have and see if you, could, if you can help and make the picture shorter. And that was my initial um, uh, introduction to uh, the movie. And so I, I was up there in the Frisco for a couple of months. And we managed, well, the, the all of us uh, were directed to uh, try to shorten or make it a little more uh, realistic in terms of a theatrical release because it was way too long. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was my uh, the reason I went up, and that's what I, I, I had the uh, the position of what they call a closer, if you will. You know? Right. Um, and I had a wonderful time. And it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a picture that I must admit that there's some some great stuff in that movie. Uh, Phil Kaufman did a great job. Well, I, so I got to ask. I mean, as you said, you were a closer. You're coming in kind of late, and brought in to kind of, uh, you know, see if you can uh, harness this thing. And so, were you greeted by the other editors who had been working on it all this time, uh, suspiciously, or they're like, Thank "Oh, you. I, I don't think so. I don't think there was a, certainly not, everybody knew the the." And the object was to to make the film better or yeah. shorter or make it more uh, uh, commercial. So we were all uh, we were all uh, focused on the same thing. I don't think there was any jealousy or anything. And since I wasn't there to replace anybody, I was only right. there to, there to augment the uh, the team, if you will. Right. And so I, I, it worked out quite well. Well, I guess it's kind of a ironic thing that uh, an epic of this scale that. I guess you were be, uh, people were wanting to bring in shorter goes and gets nominated for best editing. Yeah, it, it was it was a uh, it was a shock. I must have been. It was it was very gratifying for me because that that was a very good year for me because uh, the the uh, the ACEs, which is the the uh, honorary organization of the American Cinema Editors, and we have an, uh, an award uh, that we give out every year as well, and I won that for the uh, for War Games uh, at right. the same time that. Uh, same year that I got the the, uh, the Academy Award for uh, right stuff, so that was that, that was a thrill. Well, uh, I guess uh, if you just join us, we're talking to Academy Award winning editor Tom Rolfe, talking about a lot of things, but uh, the occasion is talking about the right stuff, which was nominated for Best Picture 25 years ago, but uh, he also he won an Oscar, shared an Oscar for Best Editing, and so uh, let me ask you about War Games because that is kind of a, a groundbreaking film with all its 
use of computers and so forth. And, and it is a it is interesting that you you were uh, associated with two films of that year, eighty three, uh, War Games and the Right Stuff, that really right. deal with uh, really deal with uh, the best of technology at that time in special effects. Yeah, yeah, we had the, the screen, the, the the war room of uh, War Games was quite uh, quite unusual. Uh, but the execution of it was brilliant, I think. And most people don't know that there was another director that uh, started the film, and he was let go of about three to four weeks into the shooting. Right. And um, and then John Batten came in to take over. I think he only had like three or four days of preparation. Uh, he had done another picture. He had done a picture called... Um, I Blue think, Thunder. Blue Thunder, thank you, yes. And so his, the editor that he had normally worked with was unavailable because he was... Uh, trying to finish Blue Thunder, so they asked me if I would stick around with War Games because uh, since I've been hired by the original director, and uh, so I said I did, and uh, turned out to be a very good relationship because uh, Batman and I did another picture called Stakeout uh, right. a couple of years later. Yeah, but uh, War Games was a uh, yeah, it was the the, the, the pre planning was done by the the original director of all the screens about how they would work and what the the uh, the the um yeah, the incoming or the outgoing missile attacks um but it was done so well and it was kind of uh, revolutionary for uh, for special effects at that point right well i got to ask uh, to go back to 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 the right stuff okay so what, what what was it like i mean cuz this is pre you know you know, pre uh, you know all the entertainment blogs, entertainment websites, pre yep. e online. So, how did you find out that you were nominated? I'm assuming, I, you know, it's not like uh, I I don't know. Was it like it is today, where you know supposedly everyone is up in the morning, ready to you know watching the uh, announcements? I I gotta assume it wasn't like that back in '83, '84. No, and not only that. I mean, I didn't even. I mean, I had no idea that uh, that we even had a chance. Mm-hmm. First of all, because there, there was five of us involved, and uh, and that was very very unusual. And of course, there was so much film to, to work with. We, I mean, uh, I guess you you could go back and recut the movie and make it into a four hour movie because there was so much material involved and scenes that played uh, you know played you know for uh, let's say four to five minutes were cut down to a minute or a minute and a half. So there was. There's a lot of stuff in that uh, vault somewhere. Wow. Um, so it, it, it was a, in a very intense uh, amount of time spent in the uh, in the cutting rooms, uh, dealing with the, you know dealing with the length problems. Mm-hmm. But so, and so you get nominated. And so what was that? What was it? How did you find out? Did, did someone call you in the? Yeah, afternoon? somebody somebody called me and said, "You're not going to believe this, but you got nominated for uh, for the right stuff." And I thought maybe because I've been nominated or won for war games because of the ACE awards maybe that they said that you're nominated I figured it was going to be for war games but no it was the right stuff so that was a, a big shock a big surprise and so what do you remember of that Oscar night and uh, what do you remember <laughs> that night and I'm, I'm guessing uh, someone was appointed the uh, spokesperson for the five mm-hmm. of you. I, I, uh, who was that person? Well, there was not that person. As a matter of fact, it 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 it, it was a strange thing. We all five were on on the uh, on the stage, and I forget exactly who it was. I think it was Glenn Farr, who Glenn Farr was the most senior of all the uh, all of us because he started the uh, picture about a year year and a half before, mm-hmm. and he took the microphone and then he passed it over to. To somebody else, and so on. and I, I was at the end of the line, and I, uh, I did the wrap up, if you will. Um, but all five of us um, had a uh, something to say, mm-hmm. and, and I think and uh, Johnny, uh, uh, what's his name? God, I can't remember his name now. Johnny um, Carson. Johnny Carson was the the host at that point, and uh, yeah, it was. Uh, it, we, we got by. You know, you, you, it's very difficult when you're standing up there on that stage and with the microphone. You're looking out; you can't see anything because you got all these lights in your eyes. But you are talking to millions of people throughout right. the world, and when, once you're aware of that, it really it, it tends to humble you a lot. It was a remarkable experience. Well, I, I'll have to ask the inevitable question: uh, Where is the statue? 
it's in storage. <laughs> and the, the reason it's in storage is because the, uh, my wife and I are we, we're moving uh, all of our stuff and everything from uh, from well from America to Europe, and we're going to be headquartered in Europe. Oh, okay. So that's why it's in it's in transit. Let's put it that way. <laughs> okay. Well, before I let you go, I got to ask about a couple of titles that uh, I stated earlier in the '80s. You were kind of uh, associated with a couple of uh, <laughs> notorious titles. Uh, I beg your pardon. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> one being obviously um, Heaven's Gate. Oh yeah, yeah. And um, you know, I, this might go back to that question I was talking about with the. Clambake when you know you're in that post production and you know it's it's not working if yeah. you will. Uh I guess this is, you know, this might be a that similar situation, you know, years later but you know on a bigger scale. And what what was that what was that like? Well, you're dealing with two different kinds of people, the director of Clambake and the director yeah. of uh, Heaven's Gate. Um Whereas the director of Clambake, uh, on a much smaller scale, of course, the movie and everything, was uh, receptive to any kind of a idea or a, a cut or a trim or whatever, and take a look at it and say, no, yes or no, yeah, that works, what a good idea, what a bad idea, etc. Uh, the uh, the director of Heaven's Gate would would absolutely refuse any any kind of a. Uh, um, observation about his quotes his work so if he said well what do you think of that and i said i think it's too long he would take personal objection to the point that he felt that i was attacking him not not the film right and it became an untenable situation and i was on the film for 17 months and finally i said i can't take it anymore because he he made it absolutely so difficult and i knew that it was it became a matter of ego, who's going to be in control? And not that I, not that I assumed or even re- remotely wanted control. I just wanted to be able to make a intelligent uh, uh, suggestion, maybe, because it was just it was just horrendous, and it got mm-hmm. worse day by day. So if uh, if he said, uh, you know, if I said I think that's too long, he'd say make it three feet longer. Just, just yeah. So um, <laughs> did you I, ever as a post did you ever talk to? The editor who came in after you to follow his orders. Well, yes, and also what happened. I don't know if you remember this, but they yeah, he had a terrible time, of course, as well, because everything then became my fault. Uh, that uh, he had to correct all the things that I had done wrong, but of course, all the things that I had done were at the explicit suggestion of the of the director. Right. In any case, um, yes, I just spoke with him, and then after the picture released. Um, I called a friend of mine at uh, at UA, and, I, and they released in New York, by the way, on a certain night. I forget exactly what the Thursday or Friday night, New York. And I was kind of, I, I was, I, I had a fearful moment, saying, "Well, maybe, maybe this director is a, maybe he's a genius. Maybe, maybe he is right. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe I've been all this deluding myself." And so I called this friend of mine at UN and I said, what happened at the opening in, in New York? And uh, he said, we just pulled it. And I said, what? He said, yeah, we, we pulled the release. And the re- reaction was so incredibly negative that they didn't even play out the first week, uh, which they were bound to do. They had to pay a penalty. And then they went out and they recut the movie for six months, brought it back, uh, oh, I think about 40 minutes shorter, and re-released it. And, of course, it tanked again. So mm. it, has a cer- it has a certain cachet to that uh, film it's uh, yeah it, it, it's uh, well from what i understand it has a rather actually rather loyal cult following in europe it does so, it, and, and the, the french the four hour cut yeah of course the uh, the french love it and but they also love jerry lewis so um i, I don't make a comparison there but <laughs> strange uh, right strange uh, strange and, uh, and I guess the the other film that I'll uh, I'll, I'll ask about because uh, and here's a a film I guess dealing with censorship uh, or having to make modifications. That's nine and a half weeks. Yeah. And uh, I'm curious when you were doing that film. And by the way, I am a fan of nine and a half weeks. Uh, so I'm curious uh, oh. when when you were doing that in post production, did you know you know. We're not going to be able to get. How early on did you? That, did everyone know that there's some things we're not going to be able to get away with? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I, th- there was one time, I can't remember the exact amount of time, but I went back to the 
to the uh, what do you call it? the uh, the board the censorship board in Sherman Oaks, California, and I went back three I think three times in one day and four times the next day, making many skill cut because they won't tell you exactly what they want. They just say no, you can't you can't release it, but they can't they won't tell you exactly what to take out. So we knew the areas that we had a problem in. So I'd go in and snip at a frame and or take a couple of frames off and do this. And finally, I think they just got tired of me showing up. Like many times, they finally let it go. And I think we got away with a, we got away uh, with much more than we should have. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, by the way, nine and a half is one of my favorite uh, pictures too. I think it, it looks sensational. And the director Adrian Line is a. I did another picture for him called uh, Jacob's Ladder, which is one of my favorites. And that's a remarkable piece of work, editing yeah. and just visualization. I, yeah. I, I am curious, because I have had this. I've had a question that that, that I wanted to ask uh, editors who are on certain films. Like, what is it like to actually edit a sex scene for maximum effect? I mean, it's one thing when you have it written on the page, and it's another thing when you have the raw footage. But I mean, you're actually having to shape it to something that is kind of, uh, you know. Supposed to be effective, if you will. Well, I I subscribe to the the old method. I'm being a little bit uh, uh, going over the top here. In, in that, in the older films, you um, you saw Cary Grant take uh, Deborah Carr, or whoever the lady was, and then, and walk into the bedroom. And I shut the door, and that's that's the end of the sex scene. But you could your imagination is what what made the the scene work at that point. Uh, and it's the same thing about cutting it. Uh, the less you show, the more the, the audience is able to imagine and and the picture, um, and I, therefore that, I think that's the way it, it works best. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, Mr. Rolf, uh, I want to thank you. Uh, I could go on and on. We, we I didn't even get a chance to talk about a, a Executioner song or Heat, uh, which oh. are also two of my all-time favorites. Um, yeah. uh, I did I did have a as you know Executioner song is now out on. DVD last year, and I had a I had the privilege of talking to Lawrence Schiller about that. Oh, did you? Yeah, I haven't talked to Larry in a long time. That's, I, I respected Larry; did a wonderful job on that picture. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, my my involvement with that was on the second half. I did the the second night. Uh, I forget who the gentleman who did the first night, but yeah, I I, I can point to that uh, to that particular show with great pride. I liked it a lot. And were you responsible for, I guess, editing for television? The you know, I guess the more the cleaned up version. If you, uh, I, you know, I think I don't remember if I did a television version or not. I, I Larry would remember, but I don't. At the time, I know I was doing a couple of things. I, I there was a couple of times in my life, in my career <laughs> that I was working on one picture in the, in the evening and one picture during the daytime. So, getting a little confused. All right. Well. Uh, Mr. Rolf, I want to thank you for taking this time out to talk about many things, but particularly the right stuff. Uh, it's been a real, real pleasure. Please, uh, uh, I know you're moving to uh, you're moving your base, but please, uh, you have an open invitation to call back, uh, call back anytime. Okay, fine. And who's now? Who's coming up next? Uh, Veronica's coming up next. Yeah, uh, Veronica would, Cartwright. Would and, you please, uh, would you please tell Veronica uh, hello for me? I will do that. Too. I will most and, certainly do uh, that. And you can pass on the, my email address if she would like to have it. Okay. Okay. No, I will do that myself. Okay. I'll All talk right. To you soon. Okay, Aaron. Thank Thanks. you. Bye bye. Bye.